Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. We're going to be looking at the first 15 verses of this chapter, chapter 17, the book of Acts, and as always, when we open the Bible, we want to remember that we are about to read God's very words. God's very breath is what Paul calls the Word of God, the breathed out words of God. God is speaking to us through His Word. And as the writer of Hebrews says, when the Bible is received, the Holy Spirit is re-speaking. He is presently speaking that Word to us so that this story we are about to read has present relevance, present transformational power, present voice of God uttered into our hearts. So with that as our anticipation, let's begin reading in Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. And joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. And God bless the preaching of his word. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. So begins the classic novel, The Tale of Two Cities, by Charles Dickens. I think that paragraph could have equally been written about the twin cities of Thessalonica and Berea. It was the best of times in these cities, and it was the worst of times. It was an age of wisdom. It was an age of foolishness. There was belief, and there was incredulity. There was light, and there was darkness. And Luke, I think, intentionally wrote the story of these two cities 
in such a way that we would see the incredible contrast, not just of the cities, but of the results of the proclamation of the gospel. I'm sure you noticed that the intentional contrast uh, between what is happening in these cities and in the cities themselves. There is a, a, a use of contrast in this story that's, that's very purposeful. And I think it's designed to prepare the church for something, to prepare us for something. And Luke's readers, as he reads this story of the early church, and that is that the progress of the gospel will always result in the joy of salvation and the pain of opposition. The progress of the gospel will always result in the joy of salvation and, and the pain of opposition. That there, There's a certain certainty that Luke's trying to get across to us about the opposition that will result from proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, the one and only Savior and King, that goes right along with the joy of seeing people come to faith. And, and the church needs to be prepared for that. They need to be prepared for this kind of contradictory response because it's the same response that's going to be present in every age, in every culture, in every church, in every proclamation of the gospel. There will be joy and salvation. There will be painful opposition. Those two go together because there simply is no way for the human heart to respond in neutral to the message of Jesus. There is no way, there is no way for the human heart to respond in neutral to the message of Jesus. You're either going towards him or away from him. And not every unbelieving person will act out the way these people in Thessalonica did, but every human person is either a believer in Jesus or a rejecter of Jesus. There is no neutral ground when it comes to the king of the world. And Paul lives this journey, and Luke writes about it, I think, to prepare us for that, to build our anticipation for this reality, this dual reality. These two cities, these two responses are present today. They are present in the world around us, and we need to anticipate these two responses to be present as our church proclaims the gospel, as you share the gospel, as you live out the Christian life the way Paul and Silas and his friends did as well. All right, let's walk through the story, and then I want to make a number of applications for us in our church. All right, first of all, you notice that the brothers, surprisingly, again, in spite of the way they were treated in Philippi, beaten, put into jail, they see wonderful conversion, as Aaron spoke about last week, of the jailer, his family, there is a church planted in Philippi, and then immediately they pass through Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they come to Thessalonica, and what do they do right away? They go right into the synagogue of the Jews, and Paul begins to preach from the Scriptures, explaining in verse 3 and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, the Messiah that I am describing to you in the Scriptures has come, and his name is Jesus. Now, I, I, I am... Oh, I hope in a godly way. So envious of these synagogue messages by Paul. Aren't you envious of that? I mean, imagine that. Paul himself comes into the synagogue. He's there, and they have the reading of the day. And then probably they have this moment where they invite Paul to share something. And he, from the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, remember, the New Testament uh, Scriptures are not available to these people yet. They're just going off of what the Old Testament prophets and writers had, had given to them from the Lord. And from those Scriptures, he is talking about the Messiah, their Messiah, the one they've been looking forward to, the one they've been anticipating. He's saying, look, let me explain and prove that the Messiah of the Old Testament Scriptures had to suffer and rise from the dead. That this was God's intention. And so we don't know where he went, but he might have gone to Leviticus and the atonement for sin that always required sacrificial victim. He might have gone to Isaiah 53 and talking about the servant of the Lord who suffered in place of sinners. He might have gone to Psalm 22 and talking about a righteous sufferer who suffered and felt forsaken of God and was forsaken of God. We, we don't know, but in some ways, he walked them through the Old Testament Bible, and he says that the Messiah that we've been anticipating had to suffer and rise from the dead. And then he makes the claim, I know his name. I know his name. His name is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. 
A man born to a woman named Mary who walked the fields of Jerusalem and he preached the gospel of the kingdom. And one day he was betrayed and crucified under God's curse on a cross, but he rose from the dead. I have seen him with my own eyes. And this is the Messiah that the Old Testament predicted. This is the Messiah that you must believe in if you are to continue to be God's people. This is God's great salvation. You must believe in him. This is what the Bible was anticipating. Imagine that message. Imagine it. But somehow, it appears in Thessalonica, Paul has to continue to preach. He has to persevere. It says that on three separate Sabbath days, he kept preaching to them. So it doesn't seem that they were initially open to this message. There seemed to be a a stubbornness, a sluggishness of heart, I think, if we read between the lines. But in verse 4, it says, some of them were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas. So there is this small church that is established, a small number of the Jewish people and then many devout Greeks. So these would have been people who were somehow attending the synagogue. They weren't full Jews probably, but they had some respect for the God of Israel. And it says not a few of the leading women. So there was this Greek population that hears the message of Jesus as the Messiah for the world and they believe in him and trust in him as their savior along with a few of the Jewish members of the synagogue. But then when the rest of the Jews, and probably this has some reference to the Jewish leadership in that synagogue, when they see the number of Gentiles that are converted to Jesus, they are jealous, it says. Look down there. You see that in in verse 5? It says they're jealous. They are jealous, and what do they do? They take some wicked men of the rabble, So they go find some men in the city who are called rabble. They're basically good for nothing, willing to do anything, probably for a price, willing to jump in on any mob, and they form a mob. They set, it says, the whole city in an uproar. So because these these Jewish members of the synagogue, they they see this big conversion of Gentiles. And and like all conversions, I'm sure it's full of joy and enthusiasm and celebration. Oh, wonderful Jason. Jason the Greek has been converted. And so has this wonderful um, woman of the town. And we're, we're so thrilled to see these people come to faith. And Paul and Silas are probably rejoicing. And they can just sense the joy. And they realize something has changed. They, they, they realize that apparently in the gospel Paul is preaching, there is no preference given or status given to their own place in the hierarchy of this new church. And probably also they don't like the fact that all of these people who were attending their synagogue are now listening to Paul. They don't like that very much. They're jealous, it says. They don't like the attention he's getting. They probably don't like the attention Jesus is getting. They they, they don't want their devout Gentile adherents to start listening to Paul instead of them. So they're jealous. They form a mob, it says. The irony of this passage is profound. Those who are tasked to be God's special possession on earth, illustrating God's glory, turn into a mob creating lynch, basically a a lynch mob looking to destroy this preacher of the gospel. You should feel the irony of the passage. God's people have become the enemies of God's representative. So much so that they're willing to declare a kind of allegiance to Caesar rather than believe in the kingship of Jesus. Did you notice that? They they drag this apparently new convert, Jason, who has a house in the town, has been hosting Paul and Silas. I think we're to assume that he is a new uh, convert. He has opened up his home to serve Paul and Silas. He drags Jason, because he can't find Paul, they drag Jason before the authorities, and they begin accusing them of sedition. Paul is proclaiming another king besides Caesar. We're, We're supposed to feel the irony of this. Wait a minute. The Jewish leaders are mad at Paul for talking about a different king than Caesar. 
The Jewish leaders are, are trying to defend Caesar's kingship. Caesar that had subjugated them, that had conquered their lands. That Caesar. And I, I think in, in Luke's writing of this, we're supposed to see, look, the, the world has turned upside down. They're not wrong. The world has turned upside down. But the irony is the people who should be listening to the wonderful news of God's salvation coming in Jesus to the kingship of Jesus are now so opposed to the popularity of Jesus in the Greek world that they would rather be loyal adherents to Caesar than see Jesus' name promoted in their town. power of jealousy is profound and it is turning the world upside down in the city of Thessalonica. They take this young Christian Jason to the courts. They demand some kind of security money from him. There's speculation that that money might have been some personal guarantee that Paul would not remain in the town because he immediately leaves, and we have some sense elsewhere in the Scriptures that he's not able to return easily to Thessalonica. So perhaps there was a legal banning of him in this town. And given Paul's pastoral heart, you can imagine the pain of this. And you can sense that when you read the writing to the Thessalonians. If you read that letter, you sense Paul's affection for this young church. That in spite of the persecution they endured, they were faithful to the gospel. And his love for them, that after only a, a very short period of time, it seems, he is sent away from them and is left to wonder about their health. So much antagonism is present when the name of Jesus is proclaimed. It is the best of times. It is the worst of times. Salvation takes place, and with it, opposition comes. The brothers, it says in verse 10, immediately send Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, about 45 miles away. And when they arrived, they went into a Jewish synagogue. I'm always struck by the persistence of Paul and his companions. He is just relentless. He will not stop. I mean, let's remember, he was just in Philippi. He was beaten. He was put into prison. He's singing in jail. He gets out. There's a conversion. He goes to Thessalonica. He preaches in the synagogue. They drag his friends before the authorities, ban him from the town. He goes into the next city that he reaches. What does he do? He immediately goes into the synagogue and begins preaching. There is this inspirational doggedness about Paul that I think we're supposed to receive. He will not stop spreading the good news of Jesus. He seems to be not surprised at all at these results. This seems to be his expectation. Apparently, the gospel will always result in conversions and in opposition. So what happens? Now, it says, and there's a clear contrast painted, these Jews were more noble. And I think that's supposed to be this commendation that readers of this book should receive and be motivated by. Don't be like this mob of Thessalonica. Be like those who are willing to listen to the word. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, but you're just interested in in what we teach and believe, uh, let me just represent this passage to you as a, a wonderful example There are those who would be outraged to hear the message of Jesus, and then there are those who are willing to listen. Be those willing to listen, to hear what a Christian message is, what the Bible says. That's what these these people were like. They were willing to listen and to examine. They cared about God's word, these Jews. And so it says down there in verse 11 that they examined the Scriptures daily with eagerness to see if these things were so. The result of Paul's preaching and their willing willing listening is that many of them, in verse 12, therefore believed. And again, not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. I just want a quick note about the women. You notice the women referenced twice in this passage? Luke, Luke takes great pains in his gospel, the gospel of Luke and in Acts, to talk about how the gospel message came to women. Now, now culturally, this is a very intentional point. Luke is making the point that this is not a gospel for men only. This is not a gospel for people of certain social stratus. This this is not a gospel only for a certain type of culture or ethnicity. Anybody, anybody can hear the message of Jesus and respond. 
He's making that point very clearly. And in a culture that was largely chauvinistic, this is very helpful to hear. Luke is intentionally, almost defiantly, putting it in his book. And many women believed in Jesus. It's it's wonderful to see that there is no chauvinism in the Bible. There is no genderism of any kind in the Bible. There is a sense of the gospel goes, and anybody who hears it and responds can be saved and immediately becomes united with Jesus Christ. Wonderful. And notice verse 13. Notice how Luke picks up how intense is the opposition to the message of Jesus. Verse 13, when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, what did they do? What did they do? They hear about the word of God 45 miles away. No car. This isn't a quick drive, okay? This is a long way away. 45 miles away. What do they do? They come there. They come there and start agitating and stirring up the crowds again against them. So deep is this hatred of the message of Jesus and the fact that it includes all nations into its scope. So profound is the jealousy that drives them to be first in their own lives and in their religion that they will drive to start another mob and cause more problems for Paul. Opposition to the gospel is not faint-hearted. It is not faint-hearted, and it is unwise for the church to assume that it is. It is not. It is driven passionately by an anger and hatred at God and the message of the cross. It is determined. It is zealous. It is persevering. It will travel long distances to make trouble for the message of grace. Luke writes this so that we're aware. Don't be surprised by this. Don't be surprised when opposition to the gospel travels a long way to make trouble for you. Don't be surprised at the thought, is is this really worth it? Really worth it for you to go so far out of your way to make trouble? Well, apparently it always has been. A joyful advance of the gospel will result in determined, painful opposition along with salvation. Remarkable. They send Paul away again. They're not, they're not looking to be foolish or brash. They, they want to protect Paul when it's clear that he has no way to stay there safely. They remove him, and he's on his way then to Athens. He leaves Timothy and Silas there, I think probably because of the newness of this church, and he wants to try to help and preserve uh, these believers and establish some kind of order in their new community. Likely, in light of what we read in the letters, that is often Paul's heart. He's often sacrificing his helpers for the sake of caring for Uh, needy churches. Wonderful to see that disposition. He's willing to go on alone so that Silas and Timothy can can stay there probably and help establish these young converts. Wonderful to see that in him. What do we get from these two stories? If you read them both through, I think it lands on that message. The progress of the gospel will result in painful opposition along with salvation. It will result in those things. That that is, by definition, what's going to happen as the gospel advances. And I think the church, the readers of this book, and we are, are to prepare for that reality. We're to prepare for the best of times and the worst of times. The age of darkness and the age of light. The age of hope and the age of hopelessness. The age of joy and the age of anger. Those two things always come together. As Paul will write later on, he said, The gospel is the aroma of Christ to those who are being saved and the aroma of death to those who are perishing. There is this dichotomy of responses to the word of God. There is no neutral when it comes to the gospel. And this is a lie, I think, of our culture, that there can be this accepted plurality, a neutrality towards all religions. I love them all, and I'm limited to none. 
The Bible says, no, that is not the case. Deep in the heart of every person, there is either love for Jesus or rejection of Jesus. There is no middle neutral ground of respecting Jesus but not submitting to him, of approving of Jesus but not adoring him. There is no such ground. We all live in the Jesus kingdom or in the kingdom of the one who hates Jesus. Very, very valuable. This story is very valuable to us. It prepares us for the reality of the Christian life. Now, what does this mean for us as a church? I want to I kind of organize some application around two main points. What do we do with the preparation that Luke is giving us that the gospel will result in salvations and in painful opposition? What do we do with that? What do you do with that? Well, the first thing I think we do is we receive and continue to receive the gospel with faith. We, we can't stand for the gospel if we aren't receiving the gospel. If we haven't received the gospel first, we can't stand for it. And I, in this passage, I do think the believers, that the, the, the converted ones in Berea, are, are meant to be a sort of an example for us. They're meant to motivate us. To, to be those who are willingly, eagerly, biblically receiving the good news of Jesus. Receive the gospel with faith. And first of all, we have to receive it for salvation. So let me say again, if, if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus, let me tell you the same thing that Paul told those Jews in that synagogue. You and I and all of us were sinners against a holy God. He made us and we don't like him and turn away from him. And in spite of that, he offers to bring us back to himself. And so that whatever sin you've committed, whatever sin, whatever kind of immorality or mental sin or selfishness or craving or bitterness or, or anything you've done can be forgiven as you come to God in repentance and believe in the forgiveness that he offers in Jesus. So what happened in that synagogue was people realized, I'm a sinner, and this Jesus that died on a cross is the only way I can be saved from my sin. What Paul's saying is, my sin can be forgiven. What Paul's saying is, because Jesus died on the cross, I don't have to be guilty anymore. What Paul's saying is, because Jesus is the hope of the world, he can be my hope too. And I can believe in him. And so if you want to receive this gospel, you have to receive it for your own salvation. You have to receive it as your hope for eternal life. Receive the gospel with faith. Also, receive it in the Bible. Receive it in the Bible. You just notice how Paul, when he's talking about the gospel, he's talking from the scriptures. Did you notice that in all these passages? He does it in Thessalonica. He's explaining and proving and demonstrating from the scriptures about the gospel. Did you notice that? It's from the scripture. Paul does not just have a canned message about the gospel. He doesn't just stand up, no Bible in hand, and say, you know, this person Jesus, and you should believe in him. No, no. he's explaining it from the scripture. He opens up the text, and he says, look right here, and I want to show you who this Jesus is, and I want you to believe in him. This gospel that we need to stand for that divides the world ultimately is the gospel of God's word. It is the gospel that comes with divine authority. That's why it's worth anything. The gospel that is merely Christian optimism is worthless. The idea that we're going to go to heaven because we're good Americans, worthless. It offers no comfort and no security. The gospel that says God will save you because that's his job, worthless. Who says? God's under no obligation to do something because people think he should. Only Americans would think that way. <laughs> Nowhere else in the world does anybody think someone in authority is obligated to do something because you think they should? All the Americans think that way, and it's ridiculous. In the Bible, it's clear. God is under no obligation to do anything because people think he should. And so what does Paul do? He says, look at what God has said, and what he has said is that he has a Savior that can save sinners. The gospel must be received as the gospel of the Scriptures. 
Notice that Paul preaches from the word. He talks about the word. He's saying this is God's testimony. He's saying on divine authority, I can declare this. Paul always is is working from some act of God. With those who have no knowledge of the scriptures, he starts with God's revelation and creation, how there is a God out there somewhere. He starts there, but you can be sure he moves to God's special revelation, and he declares, this is the God who has spoken, and what he has spoken about is Jesus. If we're going to stand for the gospel, we have to receive the gospel as coming in the scriptures. Notice how the emphasis is on the Bible. I just want to make a... a Sort of an aside about the importance of the Bible and our hope in the gospel. It is taking place, um, even in the evangelical world, this idea that there is a, a sort of gospel centrality that doesn't have to reference biblical authority. That biblical authority can be uh, sort of put to the side or questioned or undermined without any damage to gospel hope. So you have things in the scriptures that are very clear. I'm not talking about vague areas of, of secondary doctrines. I'm talking about very clear statements of the scriptures that are discarded without any loss of confidence in the gospel. But the gospel only gives us hope because it's God's word. And God's word, if it is not truthful in all that it says, cannot be trusted in anything it says. And so if you abandon some part of God's word because it's culturally sensitive, you have no hope in what it says about Jesus and hope for salvation. So when you're fighting for the clarity and the authority of God's word in one area, ultimately you trace that line back to wanting to preserve the divine attestation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We never separate full biblical authority from full gospel confidence. Where one goes, the other will follow. David Mathis, in his excellent book, The Habits of Grace, says this, Without the Bible, we will soon lose the genuine gospel and the real Jesus and the true God. Receive it in the Bible. Receive the gospel. Also, let's receive it with eagerness. Notice the Bereans. I think they're presented to us as this example in this passage. Receive it with eagerness. With eagerness they examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And surely if you know that these things are so, we should continue to examine the scriptures daily. Whether we're wanting to receive the gospel for ourselves or whether we're wanting to follow Paul's example in sharing the good news of the scriptures with others, in either case, we need to receive from the scriptures the truth of the gospel with eagerness, with this kind of daily anticipation. I was convicted recently how easy it is for me to go day after day with little gospel eagerness in my heart, little gospel study. Not that there's no truth or not that I have have no reference to some kind of Christian worldview, but that there's not a, a gospel eagerness. That's what Paul had. That's what he contributed to this Berean church. That's what they wanted as they dug into the scriptures to see the truth about Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we need a gospel eagerness like they had if we're going to stand with gospel courage in the face of opposition. We need a gospel eagerness. I I don't think the church that consistently neglects gospel meditation will stand in the face of gospel opposition. You're not going to stand for the things you neglect. You're not going to defend the things you forget. You stand for the things you care about. You defend the things you treasure. No, nobody goes out into the backyard and, and fights because they see a squirrel picking up an acorn. But anybody I know would fight if they see someone coming in to pick up their children. Is the gospel like an acorn in the backyard? It's there. We could get it if we need it, but we don't think about it very much. Or is it more like the preciousness of this gift God has given us? We need to have this eagerness for the gospel. It's present in Paul. It's present in the churches he planted. 
He's present in this Berean church where they're eagerly examining the scriptures. The goal of this passage, I think, is to get the church to stand like Paul did in defense of the gospel, proclaiming it, unafraid of its opposition. The only way we do that is if we treasure it and see its value. Eagerly receiving the gospel. Receive it with eagerness. Finally, receive it with humility. Receive the gospel with humility. I think it's important to, to notice that the, the sinful cause, the horizontal cause of the Thessalonians rejecting Jesus Christ was that they were jealous of the attention that Paul was receiving. We need to take that seriously. Jealousy and the craving for our place will always lead away from closeness to the cross. Carl Henry, the great evangelical leader, was asked once at the end of his life, he accomplished all these amazing things for Christianity and amazing writer and speaker and so forth. And towards the end of his life, someone asked him, how have you remained humble all these years? And this ancient man, this giant of the faith, how can anyone be proud when they stand next to the cross? You can't be. And the Thessalonians decided they would rather retain their stature and lose the Savior. Brothers and sisters, when we receive the gospel, the gospel that we're called to stand for, we have to receive it with humility. Not jealousy, not craving a place, not craving a stature, not craving a, a standing either in the church or in the world. We, we receive it saying, the attention is on Jesus, as it should be. Receive the gospel with eagerness. The second section of application, stand for the gospel with courage. If we receive it with eagerness... I think that gets us in the place where we can be like Jason and Paul and Silas and we can stand for it when it encounters its inevitable dual result of salvation and opposition. We can stand for it with courage. Again, I think the main point of this passage is prepare, prepare for the joy and the opposition that comes when the gospel is proclaimed. Prepare for that. That is always what will happen. Jesus himself said, I did not come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword. What he meant by that is exactly what happens in these two towns. The sword of the gospel comes into the town, and it divides between those who will receive it and those who reject it. And we need to prepare for that. Stand for the gospel with courage. Stand when we are facing slander, as Paul did. Stand when we are facing slander. Did you notice that? That... that what, what the, the Jewish leaders and, and so forth, what they do is they, they claim that Paul is looking to create a political uprising. And like all satanic slander, it is crushingly subtle. How is Paul supposed to answer that charge? Because there is simply no way to answer it the way it's asked. Do you believe in another king? Yes, I do, but his kingdom is not of this world. And exactly in that nuanced answer, you can feel the eye roll of the authorities. Oh, sure, sure, sure. It's on. I see. They, they frame the question in such a way that to answer it is almost impossible. And all satanic slander operates almost always in exactly the same way. Brothers and sisters, the early church constantly faced slander. Subtle slander. Not obviously disprovable slander. Subtle slander. He believes in another king, Jesus. Well, I, I do, but not in the way you mean. Doesn't play well on Twitter. It doesn't work in a court. Yes, but no. is never an answer that the crowd says, oh, well, it's just obviously a lie. You see how the, the satanic nature of that slander works? The same thing is going to happen to the church in our day. The same thing is going to happen. Think about one example. 
You stand for certain convictions about gender and sexuality and so forth in the world. How do you convince a person who is ignorant of the Bible that what you mean is you are against sin because it doesn't please God, but you love the person who is committing that sin? Try to put that in 140 characters when people are outraged that you're saying you shouldn't live that way. But I love you, and I care about you, and this is not because I'm against you. Now, we might like to believe that as long as we're nice and gracious and kind and winsome and gentle and serve and take out the trash and stuff, that, that people would never believe that we are hateful. Let's take a lesson from Paul and Silas and Jason. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. And you have to stand for the gospel. It doesn't mean being mean and, and giving in to animosity and arrogant and pride like unfortunately some Christians have been over the centuries. And we're still gracious and kind and loving and gentle. But we just appreciate that that is not a protection against the slander that comes against the gospel. Stand for the gospel with courage in the face of slander like Jason did, Paul did, Silas did. Stand for the gospel in the face of slander. Stand for the gospel enduring sacrifice. I, I just want to make Jason, if I can, into a hero. This guy is a new believer. I mean, by any account we can have, he's a new believer. His house is there in the town. So apparently he was one of these that was converted. He confessed Jesus. And, and immediately, immediately what happens is <laughs> they come to his house and they go into the house. They drag him out before the city of Thoris. So, so before the gospel, he has this nice, peaceful, presumably comfortable life on good terms with the local authorities. After the gospel, he is dragged in and accused of sedition and treason. Is the gospel worth facing Jason's sacrifice? Every Christian must answer that question. Is the gospel worth facing Jason's sacrifice? That's the question that Luke is putting to his readers when he writes this book. What if Paul comes to your town? What if he's staying in your house? What if attending a gospel preaching church means you're associated with someone who is getting maligned and accused publicly? What if they can't find him, but they can find you? Will you be a secret Christian? Will you deny your association with Paul? Will you denounce Jesus Christ? Will you be a little more reluctant to host Paul next time he comes around? Do you feel the, the motive of this passage? Luke is trying to, to put steel in the backbones of the church to make Jason into a hero, to make Paul into someone to emulate, to declare, look, this is going to happen, but let's pay attention. Two churches were planted. Enduring sacrifice is always going to be a community event. Some people will suffer more. Some people will suffer less. You might suffer through association. You might suffer directly. But enduring sacrifice is always going to be a community event. And we want to make the early church the heroes in our own eyes, in the eyes of our children, in the eyes of the next generation. I, I want my boys to look at Jason and say, that's the kind of guy I want to be. That's the kind of guy I want to be. I'll stand shoulder to shoulder with Paul. If I lose my house, if he takes my money, the gospel produces the joy of salvation and, and the intensity of the opposition. You can't love the gospel and not be aware that that will be the result. Stand for the gospel with courage. Stand for the gospel also accepting risk. Accepting risk. You notice, I just want to zero in again, that Paul immediately enters the Jewish synagogue. 
Immediately he goes into the synagogue in Thessalonica. Immediately he goes into the synagogue in Berea. We're going to notice he moves to Athens immediately. What does he do? He starts preaching the Areopagus to the Gentiles. Immediately, 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 again and again and again, Paul says this gospel must be proclaimed. To stand for the gospel means persevering in preaching, even with the risk of further persecution. Notice in this passage, there is no temporary reward for Paul for being bold after he comes into Berea. Good for you, Paul. Way to express faith. God will make sure you don't suffer. Or the Thessalonians traveled 45 miles to make sure that he couldn't preach the gospel anymore in Berea either. So no, obedience is not a guarantee that future suffering is not on its way. In some ways, preaching the gospel guarantees that some level of suffering is on its way because that's the nature of the gospel. It lays claim to people's hearts and they say no when they don't like you for declaring that to them. If we stand for the gospel with courage, it means accepting the risk of the gospel. I was convicted by this quote from Martin Luther. He says, You are not only responsible for what you say, but also for what you do not say. That's true for people we could have talked to and didn't. I think it's also true for the way in which we present the message. You are not only responsible for what you say. Many Christians can say the gospel in a way that is not offensive. But the true gospel is offensive. And if we leave out the offensive parts, we are responsible. George Whitfield said, if you're going to walk with Jesus Christ, you are going to be opposed. In our days, to be a true Christian is really to become a scandal. I cannot help but think that that is part of what motivated Paul and Jason and those dear believers in Thessalonica and Berea because they're serving Jesus Christ, who died a scandalous death on the cross to pay for our scandalous sins. In Paul's mind, that is the noble life. That is the life of glory and honor. It's to spend and be spent, becoming a scandal if necessary, for the sake of worshiping a scandalous Savior. We stand by the cross, unashamed of its shadow, unashamed of our crucified and risen king because he was not ashamed to call us brothers and rescue us. Ultimately, what this drives us to is to love courageously the gospel that has saved us. To love it courageously. To treasure it so that if in some day The proclaiming of this gospel of the cross results in persecution. We can say, I have more in Jesus than anyone could ever take away. Octavius Winslow, we close with this. He says, what then is your attachment to the gospel of Christ? Is it increasingly precious to your soul, sanctifying to your heart, influential in your life? Would you bid high for the truth of Jesus at any cost of personal ease and worldly advantage and sell it not for earth's richest gem? Let's pray, brothers and sisters, that by the Spirit of God, our answer is yes. Let's pray. Lord, by faith, we say yes to that question, that you are our highest treasure, that you are our glory, that if we do face persecution like this or in some other way in our life, Lord, we we embrace it as the necessary outworking of the expansion of your kingdom. The necessary cost, Lord, for the salvation of your people. Lord, give us strength to love your gospel on a daily basis so that we'll stand for it when that moment comes.
Give us grace to start conversations, to build friendships, to share your gospel. Move in our lives and in our church. In Jesus' name.